I want to welcome you all to um, our presentation this evening under your Child's Health University here at Packard Children's Hospital. I'm Nancy Sanchez from Community Relations, and we're very excited about this evening, this Healthy Pregnancy 101 class that is uh, being presented to you. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Natalie Aziz to you. She's a clinical assistant professor in obstetrics and gynecology and maternal fetal medicine at the Stanford School of Medicine and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Dr. Aziz actually attended Stanford School of Medicine, and she did her internship and residency at Stanford, as well as a fellowship at UCSF. She's board certified in both OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine. Dr. Aziz has published research uh, on many pregnancy-related topics and has developed the curriculum for this Healthy Pregnancy 101 class, uh, which you're about to enjoy. And I will want to mention to you that because we're videotaping and we will have this posted on, on the web, um, we will not be recording your questions. We'd like to save your questions for the end. If you would, there are little cards if you want to jot down things to remember to ask Dr. Aziz so that we don't catch you or your questions for privacy reasons in, uh, during, the, during the lecture. So it's my great pleasure, uh, as I mentioned, to introduce tonight Dr. Natalie Aziz. Thanks for coming and sharing with us. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you. Thank you so much for coming and good evening. It is an absolute joy and pleasure to be here today to discuss with you what a patient along with her physician can do and steps that she can take to help ensure a very optimal prenatal care, both prior to and during her pregnancy. And this is a philosophy that's deeply embedded in our Lucille Packard Children's Hospital philosophy and mission. And as we strive every single day to provide the best obstetric and pediatric care for our patients. So with that being said, thank you and we'll get started. And just as a reminder, I will be happy to stay and answer any and all questions that you may have at the end of the program, so thanks. So today we'll be discussing a wide, wide variety of topics uh, pertaining to pregnancy. We're gonna first start off with preconception issues and then move forward to discussing what to expect in your first prenatal visit, followed by what to expect in the first, second, and third trimesters, and then specifically address counseling issues pertaining to nutrition and weight gain, work, exercise, travel, and some other issues associated with pregnancy. So preconception is a very important time and preparing for pregnancy has many things to consider. To start off with, optimizing one's pre-existing medical conditions is extremely important. So that means things such as medical complications like diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, seizure disorder, all of those are very much aimed at helping to optimize them prior to initiation of your pregnancy. Next, we hope to aim for an ideal body weight or close to it with a normal body mass index and then finally, promoting a really healthy lifestyle, not only with diet, but also avoiding substances such as tobacco, drugs, and alcohol is always helpful, especially in the organogenesis or organ development period during pregnancy. And finally, consulting with your physician is very important regarding a variety of issues, including medication safety. So there are many medications that we try to avoid in pregnancy, including things like Accutane, ACE inhibitors, which are used to treat high blood pressure, lithium, which may be used to treat seizure disorders, for example. You also want to avoid multivitamins with a high dosage of vitamin A, especially over 10,000 international units per day, in that these levels have been associated with birth defects in particular, neural tube defects or spina bifida, for example. Next, choosing a prenatal vitamin obviously is very important for many couples. Um, in all reality, many prenatal vitamins are um, wonderfully sufficient. Things to keep in mind would be folic acid. Generally, we need about 400 to 800 micrograms of folic acid daily. And you generally want to initiate that a month prior to your conception attempts and certainly to continue during this uh, two to three months into the pregnancy and after conception. Thereafter, about 600 micrograms daily is needed and many of that or much of that can be attained through nutrition, but supplementing it will always ensure that you have a sufficient amount. Next, you know, DHA has played a big role lately in the news and patients seem to ask, um, you know, why is it so important? So DHA is one of the omega-3 long chain fatty acids and there has been some 
studies that show that there's some modest benefit to the promotion of visual as well as cognitive um, development in the fetus. So generally, a recommendation of about two to 300 milligrams daily is made. Now, you can obtain that through consumption of fish that is low in mercury, and we'll discuss that a little bit later, or supplement it through your prenatal vitamins as well. So generally, you want about two to 300 milligrams daily. Now, next would be to track your menstrual period and to arrange your preconception appointment with your provider. And that may be anyone such as a primary care physician, a OBGYN, nurse practitioner, or certified nurse midwife. And in that appointment, you can certainly talk about not only your pre-existing medical conditions, preparing yourself for pregnancy, but also things such as updating your immunizations, which is very important during the pregnancy period as well. Things like your measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine and your varicella vaccine are important to obtain prior to your prenatal care in case you are non-immune. And that generally, if you are going to be vaccinated, you want to avoid pregnancy for about a month thereafter. Other things that you want to update your immunizations on would be the influenza, the Tdap or the tetanus, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis, which is pretty big right now in given the pertussis outbreaks in California that occurred about a year to two years ago, and hepatitis B is needed. Now, these Vaccines are safe in pregnancy, but during a preconception period, if you want to start the series, it's always beneficial to begin and become immunized prior to conceiving. And so finally, um, you know, why is it so important to keep track of that last menstrual period? Well, that's one of the first ways we actually date and give you a due date for your pregnancy. So um, a lot of people, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not very intuitive. However, the first day of your last menstrual period is the day that your cycle begins, basically. And generally, so we use that as the first day of your cycle, and two weeks thereafter, most women who have 28-day cycles will then ovulate, and that'll be the time of conception. And thereafter, we use those dates to give you an estimated due date. So your first prenatal visit can be actually conducted with a variety of healthcare providers. You know, you can start off with a general OBGYN, or if your family practice physician conducts obstetric care, you can also continue with your family care provider. Other people who may provide OB care include certified nurse midwives as well as nurse practitioners. And we do have certain providers um, and a variety of providers in this area meeting all of these um, requirements. Of course, a perinatologist or maternal fetal medicine physician is also a person who is a specialist for complicated pregnancies. And at our center, we have an MFM service that not only serves as a consultant, but also as your primary care obstetrician. So if you do have any high-risk complications, you can either be referred for a one-time consult, and thereafter the doctor will help care for your pregnancy along with your general OBGYN, or people may choose to be transferred completely to our care. And so that's an option as well here. Um, other things to think about are the type of practice. So we have private practice, uh, which generally is a multi-person group, um, as well as university service or HMO. And in terms of the university service, the thing to keep in mind is that it is a teaching institution, so there are groups of people that will help provide care for you. I think they're all wonderful, including the attendants, fellows, residents, but in additionally, there's also the medical student component too that's involved. And all through excellent supervision, so you get to be a part of a multidisciplinary team. And generally, what we aim for is to help establish your care with your OB clinic by about eight to 10 weeks. So that means you call, you set up your appointment, generally you go in and have your laboratory values drawn and meet with the nurse for your first time visit, and then by 10 to 12 weeks, you wanna have your first visit with your doctor or your clinician. So as this little guy will show you here, who doesn't look too excited, um, the first prenatal visit can take a little bit of time. It is an extensive period where you get to find out about your prenatal care and your physician gets to find out about your health care history. Um, so although it is long, it is certainly worth it as it establishes the course for your uh, medical care thereafter. So things that we review during this first visit include your medical history, you know, again, diabetes, hypertension or high blood pressure, anemia, history 
history of seizure disorder, your surgical history, which may actually pertain to um, your care during your delivery if a C-section is needed, for example, your family medical history, and particularly your obstetric and gynecologic history. We really want to know about past pregnancies, you know, stillbirths, miscarriages, deliveries or terminations, your last menstrual period, the duration of your cycles, for example, and other details pertaining to your gynecologic history as well, such as abnormal pap smears or history of sexually transmitted infections. Uh, medications are always so important, and we like to review them in great detail, so prescription, but also over-the-counter, including vitamins and supplements, um, allergies to both drugs or other substances, and then it's a nice period of time during that prenatal visit to review some basic educational aspects of prenatal care, including your nutrition, exercise, substances to avoid, and as well as kind of bring up the issue of domestic violence. Now, um, sometimes people are alarmed when we ask about domestic violence at the first visit. This should not be a stigma. It is something that we ask every woman, every woman who is pregnant. It's a very important time in prenatal care to establish that rapport and to question patients about any um, situations that may be harmful to them, whether it's at home or in other environments. So the prenatal uh, exam in the first visit is also very exciting, not only because of the physical exam, but also because you generally have a first time ultrasound performed where we actually look at the embryo and we determine if the confirmation of the pregnancy as well as the dating of the pregnancy. So that's where it's important that we keep track of your last menstrual period and determine if our ultrasound measurement actually correlates. Now this embryo here is about seven weeks along and about perhaps almost the finger breadth of my index finger here. So very small and we are able to demonstrate heartbeat at this point, which is very exciting and a great time. So, you know, if partners want to come in for that first prenatal visit, it's always very um, uh, rewarding. <laughs> we also perform the pelvic exam and breast exam in addition to the traditional, you know, long heart abdominal exam. And then studies that we do at that time include a pap smear, um, studies for infections, as well as urine analysis and culture, and some additional prenatal labs, if they haven't been done already, you know, with your nurse visit, include a complete blood count to, again, check for the um, level of hematocrit and hemoglobin and assess if someone has anemia, your blood type, the RH status. Uh, we have a panel of infections that we check for, including HIV, syphilis, rubella, hepatitis B, as well as varicella or the causative organism for chickenpox. Things also which we bring up are genetic disorders, including cystic fibrosis and others as they apply to specific ethnic backgrounds. So the prenatal visit is also a wonderful time for you to become more informed about your care and a time for you to learn about the type of practice that your physician has for you. So it's important to review the scope of care. You know, you can ask how many partners does that physician have, who covers when they're gone or on vacation, for example, or what kind of call schedule they have, perhaps. Um, additionally, you know, you can discuss what tests will be done, not only at this visit, but future visits to come, your expected course of pregnancy. And of course, it's always important to always ask, what should I be concerned about what things should I report to you? You know, signs and symptoms to report to your provider. And those include vaginal bleeding, leakage of amniotic fluid from the vagina, or abnormal vaginal discharge, uterine contractions, pelvic pain. And once you feel the baby moving, fetal movement as well, which generally happens after the middle of the pregnancy, after 20 weeks in general, and any unexpected fevers, for example. Um, it's also important to discuss the type of uh, scheduled visits you'll be having, and we'll go over exactly um, how that is distributed. And then again, physician coverage on labor and delivery, because who you may see in the clinic you know, may not be on call the evening that you come in in labor, so it's also nice to be aware of the partners that are available and hopefully will be providing care for you in some capacity. And finally, um, just to summarize things, you know, it's also a good time at that point to explore the, you know, cost of prenatal care if you want, if are interested in your insurance coverage or your co-pays, that's a good time at the first visit to review that with the front desk staff, as well as um, 
practices that promote safe health for pregnancy, but also just throughout, including use of seat belts. And in particular, dental care for pregnant women is very important in that poor dentition has been associated with preterm birth. So it's also important to um, become aware of that component of preventive health that can be employed during pregnancy. And then what type of educational programs are available and additional services? For example, do you have a nutritionist or dietitian? Is there an exercise program? Are there available studies? that you know um, patients may participate in if they're interested for exercise for example or for different variety of things so a typical pregnancy is generally 280 days or 40 weeks and just to be aware that that does count from the first day of your last menstrual period so that goes all the way back there again another reason why the LMP is important to track um, and it's divided into three trimesters. And the first trimester is about from zero to 13 weeks, second trimester from 14 to 27 weeks, and third trimester from 28 to term. So the frequency of prenatal visits obviously is dependent upon the um, trimester that you are in. So generally in the first trimester until the 28th week, we see usually patients every four weeks unless there's a complication that needs more um, detailed or additional uh, attention. And then from 28 weeks to 36 weeks, we generally see patients every two weeks and then weekly after 36 to 37 weeks. So I'd love to go over some of the things that are routinely experienced in the first trimester. Although these are mentioned here, we still want you to report them to your physician, but this is a bit of a reassurance to let you know that these things are common. So if you are experiencing them, it is not atypical. So in the first trimester, generally there's nausea and vomiting, fatigue may be experienced, definitely breast tenderness or constipation. And as the second trimester comes along, there's possibly skin changes, um, hyperpigmentation or darkening of certain moles or other skin areas, and especially in the face or a vertical line down the abdomen in the midline, which is called a linea nigra. Stretch marks obviously increase. Um, sense of shortness of breath due to the physiologic changes that are going on with the gravity uterus increasing. There's also that um, infamous broad ligament pain where women will have a stretching sensation on the lateral aspects of their abdomen or uterus, and it really is the suspensory ligaments that are holding up the uterus that are starting to stretch as the uterus is becoming larger. And of course, and unfortunately, varicose veins also may be more prominent during this time as progesterone does uh, relax um, muscles and therefore varicosities may be more prominent. In the third trimester, uh, you may start to feel contractions and you know up to three to four per hour are actually within normal physiologic range. So that's something to be reassured about. Obviously, we want you to report your contractions to your physician, but again, it's nice to know that a few is, is appropriate. Back pain can definitely be um, problematic during this time as the weight gain of the pregnancy and the uterus can um, place strain on the back, for example. Lower extremity pain and swelling is, is certainly very common as well. Breast discharge may be common as lactation is starting to um, progress. Increased vaginal discharge and gastric reflux. And gastric reflux seems to be a very, very um, common and very, uh, uh, common symptom during pregnancy. So if, if you do have that, please let your doctor know. There are many things that we can do to help treat, whether it's from lifestyle modification of the way that you sleep or smaller meals, less spicy meals, to additionally where we can actually treat you with um, medications. So fetal development is this amazing <laughs> period where from about 12 weeks, the fetus actually goes from a about a two inch uh, fetus basically, and to about 20 weeks where the um, length is about six and a half uh, inches and the weight is about a third, oh, excuse me, a about half of a pound or so. And then finally, this development goes on to 40 weeks where the infant is now approximately seven and a half pounds and 20 inches when he or she is born. So there's a dramatic evolution of fetal development during that short 40 weeks of gestation. Um, and just to show you what your uterus looks like at 12 weeks, it's about the size of a grapefruit. So at 12 weeks, this is the size of your uterus, and this is the adorable size and look of your baby. So as you can see, at about 12 weeks or so, it ranges anywhere between six to seven centimeters. And it's amazing. With um, newer advances in ultrasound technology, we are able to capture some really beautiful images 
of the fetus even at this very early stage and it's always a lovely um, event to share with our families and, and parents and again um, when undergoing your first trimester ultrasound nuchal translucency it's always nice if you do want to have a partner come in to share this lovely picture with them. So first trimester also is an important time to review the genetic counseling considerations for specific families. Um, there are many families such as African American or Mediterranean that may need counseling in sickle cell anemia or thalassemias, for example, Tay-Sachs disease, cystic fibrosis, canavans, and fam uh, familial dysautonomia is, again, um, our considerations of genetic disorders for specific ethnic backgrounds. Of course, inheritable diseases are also important to consider. So if your prior child, for example, had a heart defect, we definitely want to know with subsequent pregnancies um, for further evaluation. And then finally, for screening and testing, of chromosomal abnormalities. There are a variety of screens and diagnostic procedures that you can be offered. So to start off with, the screening includes a nuchal translucency, which is generally performed between about 11 to 14 weeks. And that is combined with the first and second trimester blood screens. And it's a very um, high sensitivity uh, mode of screening patients for chromosomal abnormalities of the fetus. And then finally, for diagnostic evaluation, uh, which includes testing that is invasive though, either a chorionic villus sampling, which is actually sampling of the placental tissue in the first trimester, or an amniocentesis can be performed in the second trimester where we actually sample the amniotic fluid. So nuchal translucency and the analyte or hormonal screening is done between about 10 to 13 weeks for the blood work and the nuchal translucency is about 11 to 14 weeks. Chorionic villus sampling is performed about 10 to 13 weeks. So very early on, you will be offered the option of deciding whether you want screening or diagnostic testing. And this is a picture of what our nuchal translucencies look like for babies that are very well behaved. <laughs> if you've ever gone to an ultrasound, um, sometimes the fetuses won't exactly, you know, have that perfect mid midline profile and we have to, you know, be very patient with them, but ultimately they usually come around. So the nuchal translucency is this area here of fluid that we measure behind the baby's uh, back of the neck. And this has actually been associated with chromosomal abnormalities when it's beyond a certain uh, point. And we combine that with the maternal hormones to actually give patients a screening number. So common things that may occur in the first trimester. Um, this is, again, something that you should always report to your physician, but I just want to bring about how common it is so that when if it does happen, that we can hopefully um, continue to keep you reassured. But vaginal spotting is extremely common um, and can occur in up to 20 to 25 percent of early pregnancies. And not all of those pregnancies end in miscarriages, for example. Most of those pregnancies will also continue to um, be a viable pregnancy, which is the reassuring aspect of this. Additionally, nausea and vomiting is very common in pregnancy, particularly in the first trimester. It can affect as many as, you know, at various degrees, up to 70% of pregnant women. Um, generally, we recommend lifestyle and diet changes. Again, um, potentially eating smaller meals, avoiding spicy foods. Things that you can use uh, include ginger, vitamin B6, Unisom, which is a sleeping agent, has actually been used to um, treat uh, nausea and vomiting associated with pregnancy as well. We can also provide prescription medications that have really been very safe for use in pregnancy. And unfortunately, in about 2% of pregnancies, this will be hyperemesis, meaning severe nausea and vomiting. And some of those patients may actually require hospitalization and IV fluids or other type of medications and IV nutrition, but that is a rarity. So in the second trimester, um, fetal development uh, occurs where all the major organs and systems have actually formed, and then thereafter they just develop and grow further. The remainder of the time after the second trimester is really devoted to increase in weight, and the fetus will actually increase its weight by seven times over the next few months. So there's a dramatic period of um, growth in the fetus in the third trimester. Fetal movement generally is felt at about 20 weeks for first-time pregnant women, and as early as about 18 weeks or so for recurrent pregnancies, as moms get to know a little bit more about how a fetal movement may be and, and are able to recognize it a little bit earlier. So um, no matter how many ultrasounds I've done in my life, uh, you know, every one of these is a very special moment as, as we perform the anatomy ultrasound at about 20 weeks or so. 
This is the time where we get to introduce you to your baby and all of his or her parts. And that's when we do a very detailed survey of the fetal anatomy, where we look at the head, the heart, the gastrointestinal tract. We look at the genitourinary areas. We look at the limbs and assess also the um, pelvic organs, including the uterus and the cervix, which is the lower portion of the uterus and the ovaries. So this is always a very exciting time, and with the advent of and use of 3D imaging as well, it's amazing what pictures you can capture during these um, ultrasound assessments. Uh, in the second trimester, we also do the quad marker, which assesses for the, uh, some common genetic abnormalities, including trisomy 21 and 18, and for neural tube defects, such as spina bifida or abdominal wall defects. We also perform amniocentesis if desired. And again, this is an invasive testing where we actually sample the amniotic fluid. And this occurs anywhere between 15 to 20 weeks. And then in the late second, trimester, which is up to 28 weeks or so, we do our gestational diabetes screen and then check the blood count again because there's a component of physiologic anemia or lower blood count that is very common in pregnancy due to hemodilution. And we just want to assess and make sure that we have a um, good account and marker of the current blood count status. So third trimester, um, you know, we'll see you more frequently. After 28 weeks, we generally see you every two weeks. And then in the last four weeks or so, we see you weekly. Those times, again, we are measuring your weight, measuring your blood pressure, measuring uh, the uterus to check for proper growth of the fetus. Um, we perform physical exams uh, if there is any discomfort. Again, if people are having um, discomfort with their hands or swelling, something that commonly occurs in pregnancy is carpal tunnel syndrome, where the um, median nerve is actually compressed due to the swelling that occurs in pregnancy, and many moms will have uh, potential symptoms of that that we assess, and then obviously swelling of um, the feet and lower extremities as well. We assess the urine to make sure that we check for sugar and protein levels, as those are markers for diabetes and preeclampsia, respectively. And obviously, every time you come in, we will check the baby's heart rate and make sure that it's in an appropriate um, range. And then at 35 to 37, weeks, we also perform a group B streptococcal culture. Um, this is a transient organism that generally lives in our gastrointestinal tract, and sometimes it colonizes the vagina or bladder. And at 35 to 37 weeks, we'll check with a rectovaginal swab. And if mom has colonization, then we will administer antibiotics during labor to help prevent the baby from acquiring the infection at the time of birth. So it's amazing. I don't know how nature did this, but it did. Um, after 20 weeks, fundal height mysteriously correlates to the gestational age, which is very interesting. So at 20 weeks, fundal height is about at the umbilicus or so, or belly button. And then thereafter, it actually progresses to increase along with your gestational age. So at 24 weeks of gestational age, typically from the pubic symphysis to the tip of the fundus of the uterus is about 24 centimeters, plus or minus a few centimeters. So that's a way of us assessing if the fundal height is appropriate or if it's too large, which could be an indication that the baby's growing very largely or has extra fluid, or if it's too small, which would be an indication that perhaps growth isn't appropriately progressing or that they may be low fluid. Now, most of the times, though, reassuringly, when we do have ultrasounds to assess for size greater than dates or size less than dates on a fundal height, most of the times it's reassuring and there's appropriate growth. It's just that not every body is going to adhere to this tight rule, but it's always nice to have as a way of a screening. So in your subsequent prenatal visits, um, very importantly, it's a great idea to discuss with your physician the options for labor. And you know, some families have preferences, and it's nice to let your physician know what your preferences may be, for example. And it can be as small as, you know, I, I, I want my partner or my partner wants to cut the cord, for example. But those are all nice things to discuss and to review and how feasible they may be at the time of labor. Pain control in labor is very important to assess if there's an obstetrician at all times on labor and delivery, for example, or if they have to be called in. At our institution, we actually have a 24-hour obstetric uh, obstetric uh, anesthesiology service, which we're very, very fortunate. We have one of the leading programs in the nation, and so we have uh, our doctors there readily available to provide pain control for moms who may be interested in that. Again, planning for delivery, postpartum childcare, asking about you know hospital tours, 
car uh, seat fittings, for example, are important things, and usually your office will have that information. Breastfeeding benefits are always great to discuss with your provider as well, and choosing a child's physician. And we may not know exactly who to send you to, but I think it's nice to discuss it with your obstetrician, and they can guide you if um, for specific referrals. So some of the things also in the subsequent visits or to begin with um, to discuss with your doc are your nutritional counseling. So what is healthy and perhaps what do we need to avoid during pregnancy? So one of the things that's important is generally to limit your caffeine intake to less than 200 milligrams per day. Now, that being said, it sounds like it's quite um, restraining. It's actually not, you know, roasted ground drip has about 100 milligrams per cup tea about 30 to 35. A Starbucks coffee though has about just about that limit of about 250 and then a Coke or Pepsi is about 50 or so. So as you can see you don't have to cut out caffeine completely but drinking in moderation is an appropriate consideration. Um, as we did, reviewed before, limiting your vitamin A intake is always uh, very important to consider. And for those who have an exclusively vegetarian diet, it's really important to make sure that you take in the appropriate amino acids, iron, minerals, vitamin B12, vitamin D, and calcium, and complex lipids. These minerals and vitamins are all really essential for normal embryonic development. And so it's important to incorporate them in your diet. And I think a consultation with a registered dietitian or a nutritionist is very helpful to help you prepare and to continue to provide appropriate nutrition during your pregnancy. So another nutritional counseling um, matter that comes up is fish and how much can I eat and can, what form can I eat? So this is a very, Excellent topic to discuss with your obstetrician. Uh, methylmercury exposure definitely is something that causes severe central nervous system damage. And it can, on a milder level, cause intellectual, motor, or psychosocial impairment. So it's very important to be aware of the levels of mercury in the fish that you may be eating and to uh, gauge your um, consumption accordingly. Things that you want to avoid, um, fish uh, specific, Types are shark, swordfish, king mackerel, tilefish, because they have really high levels of mercury. Otherwise, eating about up to 12 ounces, so on average one to two average meals of either shrimp, canned light tuna, salmon, pollock, or catfish are actually appropriate and very reasonable. And one of the things to keep in mind also is the albacore white tuna actually has more mercury than the canned light tuna. So avoiding the albacore might be a good idea or limiting its consumption to only about half or six ounces. And it's very helpful. The FDA has a website where you can actually click on and look at the fish mercury levels so that if you are particularly have a craving for a certain type of fish, you can actually see the mercury levels that are noted by the FDA. And obviously, always checking local advisories is a good idea. For example, our West Coast specifics may be a little bit different than East Coast. Um, additionally, for nutritional counseling, a very important thing to remember are, is, is to avoid undercooked or raw foods. You know, there is a risk of food poisoning, whether it's bacteria or parasites. And food poisoning not only causes dehydration of the mother and deprives the fetus of nutrition, but it can also cause you know, significant and severe maternal disease. And in the fetus, uh, there's a variety of possible adverse risks, including congenital disease, which may be associated with toxoplasmosis that can be associated with eating um, raw foods, for example, raw meats or undercooked meats, premature labor if there is significant infection, miscarriage, meningitis, which is inflammation and infection of the lining of the brain and spinal cord, pneumonia, and even death for fetuses. So it's important to avoid these, especially bacterial and parasitic foodborne illnesses. You know, things to do, really thoroughly cook your food um, from animal sources, including beef, pork, poultry, and fish. So no sushi. <laughs> Wash your raw vegetables thoroughly as well, and keep your uncooked meat separate from your vegetables and from cooked foods and ready to eat foods so that they don't cross contaminate. Obviously, avoiding unpasteurized milk, cheese, and foods made from raw milk is very important in that for prevention of listeria or listeriosis. And although generally it's an unpasteurized products, as you may all be aware, there was a recent outbreak in cantaloupes, for example. So it can also be in fruits and vegetables, but usually advisory 
degrees are given for those types of situations, and those are uncommon in, in, in the grand scheme of things. And finally, washing hands, knives, and cutting boards after handling uncooked foods is also sanitary, and not only for pregnancy, but for all cooking practices. So you may ask, what's an appropriate weight gain now that we've talked about all the foods that I can and cannot eat? Well, our weight gain is generally based on our body mass index. And body mass index, we calculate using your weight divided by two times the height, basically, or height squared, I should say. So for lower body mass indexes, there is more um, a generous uh, recommendation for weight gain, anywhere between about 28 to 40 pounds. For normal BMI, which on average is about 18 to 25 or so, general weight gain is about 25 to 35 pounds. And for high BMIs, um, so between 25 to almost 30 is about 15 to 20. And obviously, the higher the BMI, such as obese, which is greater than 30, the lower the recommended weight gain. And average weight gain per trimester, and this is just average because in all reality, it's very, um, it, not many people may fit this standard. However, generally we quote about three to four pounds in the first trimester, um, 12 to 14 pounds in the second trimester, and about eight to, eight to 10 pounds in the third trimester. And in terms of all the weight and what components make up this weight, well, at term, your baby is about approximately seven and a half pounds or so. Your extra maternal energy sources, including fat, protein, and other nutrients, make up another seven pounds that you have stored. Fluid volume that also we store in third space um, the lovely swelling that may come about, for example, is an additional four pounds. Breast enlargement is two pounds. The uterus itself becomes very large and gorged with vessels, and it itself weighs two pounds. Amniotic fluid is another two pounds, and then the placenta is approximately one and a half pounds. And the thing to remember is that generally for pregnancy, an increase of about 300 calories per day is recommended for a goal of 2,500 for singleton pregnancies. Now this goal is a little bit higher for twin pregnancies as moms need additional nutrients. So additionally, the specialized counseling that we talk about during pregnancy, if um, vaccinations uh, were perhaps not updated prior to pregnancy, reassuringly, things like the flu vaccine, hepatitis B, hepatitis A, Tdap, pneumococcal, and, and meningococcal vaccines can all be administered safely during your prenatal care. We try to avoid the measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella vaccines in pregnancy. However, this is for theoretic concerns. So if one does inadvertently get the vaccine during pregnancy, please consult your physician and hopefully they'll reassure you as to that it's just a theoretical risk and not significant severe outcomes have been demonstrated when people do get these vaccines inadvertently. Additionally, whenever you go to a physician that may not be an OBGYN and that there's need for x-rays, please always consult your physician of your prenatal care. Generally, dental and chest x-rays are permitted during pregnancy. Other types of imaging um, we consider, but only if they're needed for significant maternal management issues. So it's always a good idea to talk about any x-rays with your OBGYN before proceeding with them. Um, additionally, I think pregnancy is a great time for specialized counseling for individuals that may need um, assistance in terms of tobacco, substance abuse, domestic violence, or medication use, whether it's prescription or over, or over the counter. It's an amazing period of time when um, the inspiration and motivation for healthy well-being and prenatal care can really motivate individuals to lead healthier lifestyles. So I think it's a great time to um, modify one's lifestyles to benefit not only long-term outcomes, but also your prenatal care. So in addition, pregnancy brings to the conversation of what to do during everyday activities. You know, this includes work, exercise, sex, sleep, travel, air travel, car travel. So I'm gonna just go over very briefly some considerations for each of these topics. So during pregnancy, many or most women will actually continue to work without complications. You know, it really does depend on the type of work and your medical condition. But for most low risk or uncomplicated pregnancies, a pregnant woman can continue until her third trimester, until she's ready to take her time off basically. 
So physical job demands, though, that include prolonged standing or walking, heavy lifting, working at various shifts, for example, or job stress may affect pregnancy. And so if that's the case, it, I really encourage you to discuss these things with your physician so that you can kind of modify your perhaps work environment to best uh, benefit a optimized prenatal course. Things that you want to watch out for in the workplace include metals like mercury and lead, solvents um, in the house cleaning industry, for example, cleaning agents and pesticides, exposure to pharmaceutical agents, in particular, for example, those medical personnel that work with chemotherapy. It's very important that to remember chemotherapy can be associated with miscarriage, low birth weight or malformations, and so being aware of your environments is very important. Infections are another common um, workplace uh, adverse event that we, we deal with quite often. So whether you're a school teacher or a nurse or a physician or just a plain mom who's at home with her two-year-old, there's things that can happen such as hepatitis or chicken pox, rubella, CMV, parvovirus, or toxoplasmosis, and other infections that may actually influence pregnancy. And so those types of infections not only need to be reported to your physician, but it's good to kind of assess your work environment to see what you may be exposed to and discuss that with your OB. And then finally, physical agents like radiation and radioactive waste definitely need to be avoided as they can actually lead to birth defects, miscarriage, and developmental issues. Issues. And extreme heat, especially in the first trimester, has been associated with birth defects. So if you have a really high fever, especially in your first trimester, or you just love the jacuzzi and sauna, those are things to actually discuss with your OBGYN because you really want to avoid high heat environments. So the AMA, or American Medical Association, um, recommends these lovely things for pregnant women. And I really implore you to bring them up at your workplace. You need to take a break every few hours. You need to take a longer meal break, if possible, every four hours. Drink plenty of fluids on the job, if possible. And you want to vary your work positions, you know, continuously from sitting to standing to walking. And you really want to minimize heavy lifting and bending. I had a patient who, um, you know, is an employee at Costco and had to go up on really high ladders. And that was just something that was not very safe for her during her pregnancy. So we modified her work activity. And that's something that your OBGYN will be happy to do depending on the certain situation. So people may also ask, are video display terminals dangerous for me and for my baby? Actually, fortunately, uh, video display terminals do not emit x-rays, and, so, and there has been no link to exposure of the electromagnetic field and the risk to pregnant women. So fortunately, you don't have to worry about that. Now, computers, just as in non-pregnant individuals, can be associated with neck, wrist, hand, shoulder, and back pain, and this may be exaggerated in pregnancy, so prolonged sitting at a computer terminal may not be the best for these symptoms, so if that happens, just bring it up with your physician, and I'm sure that they can work something out with your boss, basically, to help relieve some of those symptoms. And just like in non-pregnant patients, you definitely want to take frequent work breaks. You want to use detachable keyboards and adjustable chairs and use non-reflective glass on the screen to basically adjust the lighting and contrast. Now, exercise in pregnancy. Um, it's very uh, important to stay healthy throughout your life, but and additionally, during your pregnant see course. So pregnancy and exercise is actually a wonderful symbiotic relationship and we've definitely determined that exercise has many benefits in pregnancy. It can minimize the physical discomforts of pregnancy itself. It's beneficial for women with diabetes and can help keep both gestational diabetes and preconception or pregestational diabetes in better control. It actually has been proved to improve mood, energy, sleep patterns. It can increase your endurance and strength and muscle tone, and it can improve or help with the recovery after the birth of your baby as well. So if someone is healthy and has been exercising and physically fit before the pregnancy, they can safely continue to exercise throughout their pregnancy course. Obviously, you wanna let your physician know um, throughout your pregnancy, but generally continuation is very appropriate. However, women who have not had a exercise regimen prior to pregnancy, we highly encourage you to really speak to your physician before starting one. It's a very important to discuss this in consultation with your doctor so you can set up a reasonable regimen to begin you gradually.
So your target heart rate in terms of how hard can I exercise? So we usually like to say, keep it below about the 140s or so. And really, this is a level where you can conduct a normal conversation with an individual. So if you're able to talk without taking deep breaths and huffing and puffing, that's generally a very appropriate exercise level and correlates to less than 140 beats per minute. Your goal is up to about 30 minutes per day. And you know, again, for those individuals who've never started an exercise program, you wanna start this gradually and discuss it with your physician first. You want to drink plenty of fluids. You want to avoid extreme exhaustion, excessive heat, and lying flat on your back as well. And of course, if any of the following things occur in your pregnancy, we do ask for potentially modifying your exercise regimen. So whether it's preterm labor in the current or past pregnancies, if there's active vaginal bleeding or cervical issues, if there's leakage of amniotic fluid, if you ever experience shortness of breath, you should stop and discuss it with your physician and probably obtain some additional studies. Dizziness or fainting is another um, period of time where exercise may not be safe, decreased fetal activity or other complications. If your heart rate is greater than the 140 and you're not able to exercise at a level where you can sustain it below that level, and then obviously certain health problems such as high blood pressure, for example, may not make you an ideal candidate for the exercise regimen that we discussed. However, again, these things are all done in consultation with your physician and bringing these up to your physician is important. So exercises to avoid in a healthy individual, things that obviously could potentially um, be unsafe if there was an accident or a fall. So including horseback riding, water skiing, scuba diving, contact sports, high altitude skiing. Um, so virtually any exercise that can cause a serious fall. Things to also consider for exercises that are not within this group. So exercising on your back for the first trimester may, after the first trimester, may actually reduce blood flow to your uterus. So we generally say avoid exercise on the back in the second and third trimesters. Exercising in a vigorous, hot, humid environment or weather conditions is also not recommended in that you have less of an ability to have efficient exchange of heat at that time. And so we don't want to dehydrate you or cause a hyperthermia situation. And then finally, exercise, which consists of Valsalva maneuver, which is holding a breath during some type of exertion can cause increased abdominal pressure, and so we recommend avoiding those types of Valsalva maneuvers. So although some people seem to water ski, we do recommend that pregnant women do not, but it seems like it's very tempting right here. It's so easy for so many people. Um, so sex during pregnancy, that's a question that comes up often, and it is a very appropriate question. In most cases, sex during pregnancy is completely safe and um, is appropriate. Intercourse, however, may be avoided in special circumstances. Again, those that need to be discussed with your OB. So when there's vaginal bleeding, if there's any discomfort that is atypical for you, leakage of amniotic fluid or significantly different discharge and contractions. And in terms of sleep positions, um, most of you may be aware that we do recommend not lying flat on your back, um, especially in late pregnancy, in that this places, when you're flat on your back, it actually places pressure on the blood vessels that return blood back to your lower body from your heart, including your uterus. So it actually may prevent the appropriate and sufficient amount of blood getting back to your uterus and to perfusing the placenta and reaching the fetus. So that's why we recommend you to sleep on your side. Sleeping on the stomach, again, also is not recommended late in pregnancy as it applies pressure on the fetus that may um, be um, not completely safe for the fetal environment. And finally, on the side is the best sleeping position. Usually we say left, but sometimes you just can't stay on the left and you do need to change your positions and that's completely appropriate. It does allow for maximum blood flow to the fetus. It improves the kidney function of the mother and it may actually reduce um, the swelling as it allows for better perfusion and uh, return of blood from the lower extremities to the heart. One of the things that is really challenging for pregnant women is to sleep on their sides. And so that's why we recommend placing a pillow between the knees. It actually helps improve the side position and makes it more tolerable. And many women find it much more comfortable. 
So travel during pregnancy. Fortunately, um, traveling during a pregnancy is actually, uh, it is appropriate and may be performed, um, but always remember to consult your physician. You want to make sure that you've been recently seen by your OBGYN before you take a big trip. You wanna have a copy of your prenatal records. Hopefully nothing adverse will occur, but if you needed to go to a hospital, it's always very nice to have a clear record of your documented pregnancy course when you are being evaluated by a physician that may not be familiar with your case. During long airplane or car rides, we definitely recommend you ambulating if possible. You wanna wear compression stockings, especially on long trips, for example, airline trips or car trips. And travel uh, usually after 36 weeks thereafter is not recommended, and that's either by car or plane where you are going significant distances is that that's the time where most labor will occur and we really want you to to avoid having to present to an unfamiliar area and in labor, for example. And then always using a seatbelt, either in a car or a plane. And this little schematic here demonstrates, so a seatbelt should be placed underneath the belly and not over or across the belly. So the green area here is the appropriate wear of, uh, place of um, placement of the safety belt. And then finally, just as a reminder, you know, the most pivotal and important time for organogenesis and organ development of the fetus is in that first trimester, generally before you even find out that you're pregnant. So in that preconception period where you are thinking about pregnancy, it's very important to keep your medications in mind. The period of organogenesis is between four to eight weeks of gestation, and this is the time when the fetus is most vulnerable to birth defects from uh, prescription medications or non-prescription medications even. And so that's an important time to always keep that in the back of your mind, especially even before you're pregnant, to think ahead and see what types of medications would be safe if I were to become pregnant. Um, that being said, it's very important also to balance mom's health and maternal well-being with pregnancy and prenatal well-being. So it's very important that we discuss the medications that are needed. We don't want to penalize or um, you know make it a stigma for moms who do have to take medication. So there's usually a general safe medication alternative that you can um, discuss with your physician and usually we can transition patients very safely. And then finally we you know use the medication that's least likely to cause birth defects and least teratogenic and fortunately most drug classes will have medications that do not cause birth defects that we can safely transition moms to. And finally, just keeping the risks of alcohol and drugs, cigarettes, infectious diseases, medications, uncooked or unpasteurized foods, and then medical conditions as well in mind, including diabetes, high blood pressure, sexually transmitted infections, and to kind of wrap it all up and, and to think of these things as being potential situations or environments or substances to avoid during pregnancy is always a good healthy rule. And finally, when to call your doctor. We reviewed things, signs, and symptoms to report to your physician, but additionally, you know, any vaginal bleeding, pelvic cramps, or pressure should be reported. Fevers that are greater than approximately 101 degrees should be reported. Leg swelling, especially asymmetric leg swelling, which pregnant women are more at risk for um, blood clots in their lower extremities. So we always, we never take this um, lightly. It's always a serious situation and we definitely want to evaluate you as soon as possible. Severe headaches as well, pain or burning with urination, which could be the sign of a bladder or kidney infection, severe vomiting um, or inability to keep anything down because it can lead to dehydration for the mom. And that's something that we definitely want to avoid and can treat with IV fluids, abnormal vaginal discharge or symptoms, and especially abdominal trauma. Um, whether it's through a motor vehicle accident or a fall, we always want to know if, they, if he, there has been abdominal trauma and that, especially in the um, late second and third trimesters, we like to monitor the fetus. So it's always better for you to call us as soon as possible. And finally, thank you. I want to thank everyone for your time and attention, especially in this late evening. And I want to thank Mrs. Sanchez and Stonestrom for um, the Office of Community Relations and Community Programs for helping us establish this evening. And thanks for the opportunity to allow me to come in and, and talk about things that may hopefully be of value to you in your prenatal care and help lead to a very happy, healthy, and informed pregnancy. And on a personal note, I just want to thank you all for
potentially choosing or considering Lucille Packard Children's Hospital as the medical facility to have your prenatal care. Uh, we really believe and value the fact that pregnancy is not only one of the most important health care periods, but also one of the most important personal life events for an individual and her family, and we're honored to be a part of that for you. And with that, I'll take any questions that you may have, and thanks for your attention.